Well, I think you probably all already have the impression that we're going to look at something a, a bit more serious um, this morning. Uh, we do know that uh, there, there are many things in the Christian life to rejoice in, and certainly the fact that salvation is free and freely offered to us, that Jesus does it all, he pays for it all. He's even the one who gives us the grace to be able to live the kind of life he calls us to live. What we're going to be reminded of this morning is the fact that we actually do need to live that kind of life. We actually do need to be walking on that road. We can't just know about it and think it's good. We actually have to be trusting Jesus and going down that path. Uh, it doesn't do us any good to know if we are not doing. The doing shows us that we have the reality that we really do know Jesus. We really are trusting in Him. We really are saved. All of this is His work, but it does have to be being done uh, within us. So that's what we're going to be looking at in these, essentially these four challenges Jesus gives us at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Now I'm just going to read the first one, very familiar passage, uh, just two verses, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Jesus says this, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, <clears throat> and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Jesus tells us this morning, we need to enter through the narrow gate, we need to walk on the narrow path if we are to enter into life. Now, Jesus has been telling us throughout the sermon how the work that he had come to do would forever change the hearts of all who would receive him. And we know that applies not only to those, uh, to those who were there at that time, but to those who came before him, who looked forward to the Christ, uh, and those of us who come afterwards, who look back to the Christ. Um, how his spirit, Jesus is telling us, how his spirit would work in us to transform us and to make us like him. So that Jesus would be, as Paul tells us, the firstborn among many brethren, that is, people who were like him. Jesus came to make us like him. He's told us that how the Spirit of God would so change the way that we view uh, God's law, no longer as, you know, uh, oh, drat, you know, this, this is going to ruin all my fun, I can't do what I want to do, to setting us free and giving us a love for that law so that we will want to keep it, not just outwardly, but also in our hearts, so we don't, you know, not kill somebody, but hate them, not commit adultery, but lust, you know, in our hearts. We'll want to keep it with the whole person. Jesus has told us how the Spirit of God will humble us <clears throat> so that we're no longer going to be doing the things that we do for the glory of God so that other people can see us and think of, you know, how pious we are, how righteous we are, how holy we are but rather that we would be more concerned about what God thinks of us as we spend time in secret with him, showing him our devotion. Uh, the Spirit of God, Jesus has told us how he would open our eyes to the fact that heaven is a real place so that we would know that what we do here in this world will actually make a difference in the world that is to come. It will make things better for us as Jesus said, store up your treasures in heaven so that we'll commit ourselves more to him here, serving him more here, realizing at the same time that we're not giving up anything because the Lord is going to take care of us here if we put his kingdom and his righteousness first. And of course, we saw how the Spirit of God would also give us the ability to do all of these things and particularly in our service to one another by giving us the desire to love others in the same way that he has loved us. So that's basically a summary of everything we've seen up to this point. Now as Jesus draws his sermon to the conclusion, we need to remember that he was speaking to a mixed crowd. He was speaking to his disciples. Jesus went up on the mount, he sat down, his disciples came to him, he began to teach them. But there was also a huge crowd of people that had been following him because they had seen the miracles that he had done through the various areas. So there's this huge gathering of people, this huge following. Now, the things that he's saying, his disciples needed to hear this. 
But we need to remember he was also speaking to the many others who were there who had not yet believed in him. And so Jesus ends with these four challenges, essentially four tests. Challenges to those who don't know him, but tests to those who, who profess to know him so that they might see whether or not they really have trusted in him. These things were meant to get them to just step back and take a good look at themselves and to see who and what they really are. Now, these four tests, of course, were given to us for exactly the same reason, to help us do the same thing. Now, the four tests are essentially these. Jesus, first of all, points out that there's two paths, but only one of them leads to heaven. The, the challenge is, are you on the right path? Are you on the narrow path? Uh, secondly, he's going to move on to say that there's many, there are many who claim to be able to teach us the truth about these paths, but a lot of them are false. Are you listening to those who are telling you the truth? Thirdly, there are many who believe that they're actually walking on this right path and they're going to enter into life, but are we really going to do that? Um, are we doing what the Lord calls us to do and not just agreeing that it's a good thing to do? And then fourthly, of course, perhaps the most famous challenge in the Sermon on the Mount is uh, the idea of building upon the two foundations. Are we building our lives on the truth? Or are we building them on lies? Are we founding our lives, basing what we do on that which is going to keep us safe when the final day comes, the day of judgment? Now this morning, let's consider the first test that Jesus gives. Are we walking on the right path? Because we need to remember, we're only going to enter into life if we take the path that leads to life. And that means going through the narrow gates and walking on the narrow path that actually leads there. Well, first of all, let's consider the images that Jesus is using here because, again, he's drawing from very familiar images uh, that, that the people were aware of that were a part of their world. Jesus tells us that there are, first of all, two doors, one that is narrow, one that is broad, that lead to two different paths. Um, narrow path and a broad path. I know sometimes we think about the path leading up to the door and the door is essentially the conclusion, but I think this, the way, the order in which Jesus actually gives them to us, it appears as though the door leads to the path. As a matter of fact, that's the way John Bunyan also interpreted this imagery because remember that before Pilgrim could actually get on the narrow path, he had to go through the wicked gate, which was the only gate that led to that path. It was the narrow gate. Now Jesus is basically drawing his illustration here from the two kinds of roads that existed in his day. There were public roads, roads that were broad roads. Uh, as a matter of fact, they were essentially about nine yards across, 20 feet, 27 feet wide. Uh, and they were built wide because they were built for the community as a whole to use, and they were widely used. But there were also private roads that were essentially narrow, only about two and a quarter yards wide, six or three quarters feet wide, uh, because they were built for just a few, and only a few used them. Now, Jesus, again, as I've said, his customary way of teaching was to draw analogies from what people would see every day to what it is they couldn't see except by faith, and that's what he's doing here. He's pointing to broad roads and narrow roads. Now, he tells us, secondly, that these two different paths lead to two very different destinations. He says the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. The gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. He points out that there are many more traveling on the broad path than on the narrow path, as we've already seen. He says in verse 13, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. And then he says in verse 14, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. And then finally, seeing that the, only the narrow road leads to life, he calls us to enter through the narrow gate. Now that's the imagery. The most important thing, of course, is what does all this actually mean? 
Well, Jesus is reminding us, first of all, I think, and most obviously, there are only two ultimate destinations, only two places that we can go when we leave this world, only two states that we can end up in, which he calls life and destruction. Now, he says exactly the same thing in what he tells us that he is going to say at the conclusion of the final judgment. Remember, at the end of the final judgment, there is the final separation. And he is separating everyone for two destinations. He says in Matthew 25, verse 46, these, he's pointing in this case to the goats, will go away into eternal punishment. That's destruction. But the righteous, that is the sheep, will go into eternal life. Now, again, throughout the Bible we find there are no other possibilities. There is no third option. We will either enter into life, inherit God's eternal kingdom, live with God forever, or we will go away into eternal punishment. <coughs> it's going to make me cough. We will go, he says, into hell. That's what destruction is. And suffer for the sins that we've committed, for all of our crimes against him, for all eternity. So first of all, two ultimate destinations, life and death. Now second, he's reminding us that the way that we're going to arrive at either of these two destinations is only by way of one of these two roads. Jesus says that there is a broad road that leads uh, to destruction. Boy, this is the, the time of difficulties. Let's see. Get back on the path here. Okay, first of all, there is a broad road that leads to destruction. Now, let's, let's consider this road for a minute because it is broad. And why is it broad? The reason is because it is the path that all of us were essentially born on. The way to get onto the broad road is actually to enter through the broad gate, but the broad gate is the gate we pass through when all of us were actually conceived into this world. David writes in Psalm 51 verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Now, David wrote this to explain why it is he had just committed the sins that he had committed. Remember, Psalm 51 is his response to Nathan the prophet coming and indicting him for doing two things, committing adultery with Bathsheba, stealing another man's wife, and then to cover over his sin, having Uriah, her husband, executed, and then taking her to be his, his own. He did these things because of the sin that was in him. Now, he wasn't on the broad road at that time. This is essentially a remnant of that corruption that was in him before he was saved. But he's saying, ultimately, this is where that sin began. This is why I did this. But we need to realize that what David said about himself was not true only of him. This is the way all of us come into the world. Uh, this is the reason why the Gate is called broad because we've all entered into the world through that gate. Paul writes in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What does he mean all have sinned? Is he talking about uh, children? Well, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Is he talking about those that haven't even yet been born, uh, that are still in the womb? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you were a human being, you fall into this category. We all sinned in Adam when he represented us in the garden and chose to disobey God. The Bible says when he sinned, we all sinned. And when we all sinned, we were all condemned. We all got on the path, okay? Paul writes in Romans 5.18, So then as through one transgression, that is that sin that Adam committed, that disobedience in the garden, there resulted condemnation to all men, not just some, but all, 
being conceived then and born in this condition, having entered through the broad gate, we came into the world walking on the broad road. We were living in rebellion against God, and so we were on our way to destruction. I mean, that's exactly what Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. He says to the Ephesians, first of all, talking to them, and then he includes himself in, in the statement as well, and those who were with him, he says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, that is the broad road, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. Paul says there was a time when all of us were living this way. You felt like doing it, you did it. Well, that's not how you live if you're on the narrow road, but that's how you live on the broad road. Jesus calls this path broad. He calls it broad not only because there's so many people on it, but it's also broad because it's an easy path to walk on. The word broad includes the idea of, of room. It's pleasant. It's agreeable. It's easy. It was easy for us. It was pleasant for us to walk on this road, to live this kind of life, because this is the kind of life we wanted to live when we came into the world. It was very easy. That's the broad road. But there's also a narrow road, Jesus says, that leads to life. And Jesus tells us that there are those who are walking on this road as well, although there are very few compared to the number who are walking on the broad road. There are those who are able to get off the broad road by entering through the narrow gate or the narrow door. Now, this door is represented as narrow because it is the only way that we can actually get onto the narrow path through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Reminds us, Jesus is reminding us, that he is the only way. When the Philippian jailer, remember, asked Paul and Silas after the earthquake, after the chains fell off, the doors flung open, the jailer awakes, he thinks they're all gone, he's going to kill himself. They say, don't kill yourself, we're all still here. He comes into the jail and he says, trembling, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And what did they say to him? Well, I'll tell you what, they didn't say, hey, there's many different ways. Just choose one. Many different religions. They're, they all lead to the same place, so just, just pick one of them, and that's fine. No, they didn't say that. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. He is the only way. Peter said the same thing to the Jewish leaders in Acts 4, verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And you realize Jesus himself pointed to himself as the only way to the Father. In John 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. It's only when we turn from our sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ that we can get onto the narrow road that leads to life. Now, like the broad road, the narrow road is narrow not just because there's only a few people walking on it, but it's called narrow because it is a difficult road on which to walk. Uh, the word itself actually includes the idea of being strict, of being exacting. Uh, some of you here may, may still read the King James Version of the Bible. And you'll find in this particular passage that, that Jesus says the road is straight. You know, and I was just looking at Pilgrim's Progress, and I noticed that the, uh, the guy who updated it actually used the word straight as like a straight line instead of the word straight, which is spelled differently, S-T-R-A-I-T. That doesn't mean curvy. It doesn't mean the road you know, is not curvy. It's straight. But what it means is it's difficult. It's a difficult path. Now, this narrow path is difficult. It is straight because it's straight as a rule. We know that it's, you know, we call it the straight and narrow. And it is straight and narrow. 
because, again, it's according to the perfect rule of holiness. But it's difficult for that reason as well as others. It's difficult because it's a road of self-denial. You know, what we were talking about at the beginning. We have to do violence to the kingdom of heaven. Violent men take it by force. The violence is against ourselves, against the world, against the devil. We have to fight against them. We have to fight against our desire to do what we want to do instead of what the Lord wants us to do. We have to be willing to let go of our lives and lay them down to serve a new master. We're no longer the master of our lives. He's the master and we need to serve him. It's difficult, as I've said, because it's a road that is exacting. It's a road of holiness. We have to be willing to let go of our sins and to walk in his ways if we're going to walk on this road. Jesus represented it earlier as, again, a holy violence that we have to do to enter the kingdom of heaven. We have to fight against the world. We have to fight against the devil. We have to fight against ourselves and our sinful desires. You know, Paul actually likens this, as he writes to the Corinthians, as an athletic competition in which he has to beat himself, discipline himself, in order to run in such a way that he may win the prize. Listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? <clears throat> run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. You know, what Paul's reflecting here is the same thing we go through every single day. I mean, what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 7, you know. I find within myself two desires. I agree with the law of God. It's good. I want to do it. But I find in my, in my members, in my flesh, another desire to actually break those commandments. And I'm struggling. I want to do what's right, but I'm struggling with this that's wrong. You see, we, we, if we're believers, we have these two desires. And the right way is not to give in to the sinful desires, but to fight against them, to discipline ourselves, to make our bodies our slaves, to subdue them uh, so that we can yield to the Spirit of God and walk in His ways. That is how we walk on the narrow path. Now, Jesus tells us that this is the road that we have to walk on if we are going to enter into life. And he says it's a difficult road. But let me just remind you, if you know the Lord Jesus, if you've trusted him to save you, if you have received him, it's the only road that you're going to want to walk on because it's the road you love. That's what the Spirit of God does in your heart. He gives you the desire to walk in this road. You do have another desire, like I said, but your main desire is this, is to walk in those ways. And we see these other desires now as foreign, as desires we don't want, as desires we hate, because we have this new desire to go in the right way. So what is it that Jesus wants us to do? Well, he wants us to take a good look at our lives, to see which path we're actually on, because we're only going to end up where that particular path actually leads. You can't be on the broad road and expect to arrive in heaven. So are you on the narrow road? Are you doing what's necessary? I mean, to walk on that road doesn't mean you're in some physical location. It means you're living a particular way. Are you denying yourself and putting Jesus first? Are you following his example are you obeying His Word? Are you willing to follow Him no matter what the personal cost may be to you? And are you doing it not because you have to force yourself so that you can work your way to heaven, but are you doing it because that's what you really want to do, because you really love Him? Well, if it is, this, I think, above all things, is the strongest evidence that you have trusted Him, 
You have received him. You do know him. You are on the narrow path. And you will inherit eternal life. Now, if you are on that road, let me just encourage each one of us to ask the Lord every day for the strength of his Holy Spirit <clears throat> to be able to continue to walk on that path no matter how difficult it gets. And it does get very difficult. Again, think about Pilgrim's Progress, the, all the difficulties he had to face, but the difficulties were represented by the hill difficulty, which was always, every pilgrim had to go up it. It's the only way to heaven. Sometimes, you know, the road got rocky, it got difficult. Sometimes there were threats on the road and you're tempted to get off the road. Well, that's how life is, serving the Lord. It's not easy. Ask him for the strength to do it, to walk on it, and to not just walk, but run down that path. And the Lord will give it to you. He's the only way we can do it. We really need the Lord's help through his Holy Spirit. But if these things are not true of you, not denying yourselves, not following Jesus, not loving him, if you're still on the broad road, listen to what Jesus says in verse 13 where he commands you to enter through the narrow gate. Now, the gospel really isn't so much an offer as it actually is a command. Jesus commands you to do this. That's what this is, is a command. But he commands it because obviously <coughs> it is for your good to end up in life rather than in destruction. If you're on the broad road and you keep going down the broad road, that's the road where you do everything you want to do. You live the way you want to live. It's the road the world is on and you're, you're going along with them. Uh, if that's the road you're on, you're going to be destroyed along with the people of this world when the time comes. But if you listen to him, if you will turn from your sins and trust him, Jesus will save you. He will put you on the path. He will give you the grace to walk that path. And you will arrive in heaven. Now, in closing, let me just read a portion of uh, John Bunyan's uh, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. And by the way, the Chief of Sinners in this case was him. And he wanted his readers to know how God had been merciful to him, how God had been gracious to him. So it's basically his autobiography. And he speaks in it about his own conversion. And there's one portion where he basically represents his conversion as like a dream that he had, kind of like Pilgrim's Progress. And he describes his condition in terms of being outside of this wall and the people who are saved, safe up on the hill behind the wall, and what it took for him to actually get from where he was to where they were. And I think as I read this, you'll see that Bunyan did not consider the Christian life and salvation to be what we would call easy believism. You know, you just pray the prayer and you're on your way to heaven. It doesn't matter how you live. You can still be like the world and still make it. You'll see that he saw it in exactly the terms that Jesus describes it to us in, in our text. Enter through the narrow gate. It's a difficult path you have to walk. Well, listen to what he says. And by the way, I have reworded this just a bit. This isn't his, his original wording just because it was a little bit more difficult to understand. But this is what he says. <clears throat> About this time, the state and happiness of these poor people at Bedford, that is the Christians who believed in the Lord Jesus, was shown to me in this way in a dream or vision. I saw as if they were sitting on the sunny side of some high mountain, there refreshing themselves with the pleasant beams of the sun while I was shivering and shrinking in the cold, afflicted with frost, snow, and dark clouds. Between us I saw a wall that surrounded this mountain. Now I deeply wanted to pass through this wall, concluding that if I could, I would go where they were and there also comfort myself with the heat of their sun. I went around this wall again and again, looking to see if I could find some way or passage through which to enter. But for some time, I could find none. At last, I saw, as it were, a narrow gap, like a little doorway in the wall through which I tried to enter. But the passage being very straight, I want you to notice straight as in difficult and narrow. I made many attempts, but all in vain, until I was exhausted. At last, with great effort, I first got my head in 
and after that, by a sliding motion, my shoulders and my whole body. Then I was very glad and went and sat down with them and was comforted with the light and heat of their sun. Now, this is how I understood these things. The mountain represented the church of the living God, the sun, the comfortable shining of his merciful face. The wall was the word that separates Christians from the world. And the gap which was in this wall was Jesus Christ, who is the way to God the Father. But since the passage was very narrow, even so narrow, that I could not enter it except with great difficulty, it showed me that none could enter into life but those that were entirely committed. And only if they left this wicked world behind them. For here, there was only room for body and soul, but not for body and soul and sin. This is essentially what Jesus is telling us. And this is what we need to do, and we can only do it by His grace. So may the Lord give us the grace to enter through the narrow gate, if we haven't, and to, if we are on the path, to continue to strive on that path by His grace, knowing that it's a difficult road, but it's the only road that leads to life. May He give us the grace to do that. Let, let's bow in a moment of prayer and ask Him for the, uh, the strength to do so.